So it's uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's 10 EML web talk session. I'm Wei Xiao from ARM. I will be your moderator today. So first, a very special thank you to our sponsors, DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Syncense. I'm proud to announce that ARM also became TinyML's strategic partner. On October 27th, we will have Christopher Ardis from Maxim Integrated to talk about reduced energy consumption while increasing complexity of AI at the edge application. And Sika Shenha Des Duba from Edge Cortex to introduce using AI to design energy efficient AI accelerators for the edge. The talks are also scheduled at 8 a.m. Pacific time. If you're interested in presenting, please send your proposals to talks at tinyml.org. We're also excited to announce that TinyML Asia will take place virtually between November 16th to 19th this year. The full program agenda can be found at www.tinyml.org slash Asia 2020. In the meantime, we're seeking video posters submissions. Abstracts are due by October 31st. Additional sponsorship are also available. Please contact Betty at tinyml.org for more information. Our second speaker today is Chandra Upalapati from Hunumayama Innovations and Technologies. His topic today is democratization of artificial intelligence to small-scale farmers, a framework to deploy AI models to tiny IoT edges that operate in constrained environments. So Chandra is a software IT executive with diverse experience in software technologies, cloud computing, and product and program management. Chandra held engineering and leadership roles at GE Healthcare, Cisco, St. Jude Medical, and Lucent Technologies. He also teaches software and data science for a master's program in San Jose State University. Welcome, Chandra. Well, thank you, V. Thank you all. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, so uh, let me start. Uh, you know the presentation. We 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 believe in democratization of AI. Again, uh, democratization here is availability of AI across the world. Uh, Gartner recent study you know, said uh, you know to bring AI to masses, right? Uh, the data has to come out of from corporate data centers into into the needy 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 the area. So. We know definitely big data surrounds us every place. We can use big data applications across our mobile as well as we can utilize them in day in and day out. Um, but what we've seen from the market, especially when we work in um, agriculture as well as uh, in areas of uh, remote areas where agriculture prevails, um, the big data as well as AI is not penetrated there yet uh, in, in, in the way and the manner that we wanted. Uh, and there is a huge uh, discrepancy of economic disparities uh, because of lack of technologies available to them. Our proposed model, a tiny ML framework uh, to deploy uh, the supervised and unsupervised models in a constrained environment is unique and is novel uh, from the point of view of these models, especially the AI ML models, um, you know, execute and operate under a very constrained environments and work with a very, very small footprint, not even 4KB, 2KB memory, and then works on a uh, very, very uh, a perpet not perpetual memory, uh, uh, data source or energy source, works on a very small batteries. This is where we actually 
developed our models, deployed it, and collect data uh, to provide a closed loop feedback uh, to the AI uh, as well as machine learning uh, to the most needy farmers, which are very really small farmers across the world. Uh, so what are the constraints that we are seeing, right? This is the according to Gartner's as well as McKinsey's report um, that AI is needed across the agriculture as well as the remote areas where agriculture needed. Uh, however, due to lack of compute, look, lack of sustained compute and due to lack of sustained connectivity, uh, these AI systems are not able to penetrate these areas. This is one of the um, chasm that we see uh, where AI in the corporate data centers versus AI where it need to be a huge, huge disparity uh, from the uh, democratization point of view. The need, again, the need is the need is yesterday, if you will. Uh, what I mean by that is, right, the need for AI in small data, data centers as well as the remote areas is pretty much, pretty much needed for a long time. Uh, for example, right, this is the World Data, data Report on um, employment in agriculture. If you take a, a close look, right, uh, for example, early 90s, uh, the employment was around 41%. Now, this is worldwide, and currently today, 2020, the same employment is dropped uh, to, to uh, around 20-ish area. So most of the farmers, without a support of technology, lack of technology, they were moving out of the agriculture and that cr creating a huge social issues across the world, um, be it in Sacramento Valley or be it in uh, the Southern Valley of uh, Indus, uh, be it in, uh, be it in yeah, uh, uh, Midwest across the world, we are seeing this 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 migra uh, labor uh, uh, um, migration from la uh, agriculture. The second one, right, most striking difference. This is again a sources from World Bank. Now, the penetration of ICT, ICT, which is information and communication technologies, versus the poverty rate. As you can see it, right, as the penetration of ICT, information com communication technologies increases, the poverty rate goes down, which is fantastic, right? Because the technology brings so many uh, farmers who are at the thin of the poverty line out of it. However, we are seeing the ICT penetration itself is very limited because of lack of compute, lack of connectivity, and lack of AI ML that is available to them. This is the problem we are solving as part of our democratization of AI to small scale farmers across the world. Now, what, what is this uh, basically uh, uh, the lay of the land would look like, especially when you deploy uh, the machine learning models in this environment. We observe, again, we build purpose-built hardware. We observe a couple of these, uh, these scenarios across the world we operate. Uh, infrastructure issues, operating environment issues, and device characteristics. These are dominant issues where we see to deploy the AI. Again, if you uh, double click on this, again, infrastructure issues that includes lack of connectivity, intermittent connectivity, or no connectivity at all. Electricity, there's no perpetual electricity. However, some of them are driven by battery. Some of them are driven by a small scale or small form devices. Operating environment, high humidity and temperature. Again, when I spoke to a couple of farmers across the world, if we can conquer temperature and humidity, we conquer the issues that we are facing. So what I mean by that is, right, the temperature diversion, or the humidity difference, that makes most of these devices unoperable uh, to some extent in these environments that we have seen across the world now. Um, a hard terrain, for example, right? You deploy the models, remote more uh, remote areas, very tough to reach. This uh, another example of it. Uh, reachability, security, another big problems that we see um, uh, deploying the AML in this world. And finally, the device characteristics, you name it, right? And again, the minimal small firmware, which impacts the battery power or uh, power of the compute, as well as storage, security, computational power. These are all a lay of the land, as well as truth that we see across deployment of small scale AI ML or tiny ML uh, in this operating environments. 
So what we did, right? We did basically, we started to build uh, machine learning processes and then embedding this machine learning processes as part of the firmware on these custom built devices. And then we deployed them. And these models are highly, very small footprint models, not even two KB, three KB. Again, when I was in Bell Laboratories in 97, 98, we used to measure the success of a code in size of the bytes, you know, a version one to version two, how many features increase versus a, what is the code size that can be deployed. That was the stats at the time. Now the same are really applicable in this case also, given we have to store and we have to preserve every joules of memory, every joules of energy that we can think of from the batteries. Now, what is the models applied? Again, we, tr we deployed supervised, so some of the unsupervised models. Uh, anything with the DNN, anything with the um, artificial neural networks, you know, very tough um, uh, given, given uh, the power requirements. And very small, let's see, again, uh, mother of all, all uh, libraries, if you will, um, and then uh, connectivity or BLE. This is what our, our uh, structure would look like. And this is high schema. This is how it looks like from the end-to-end -end point of view. Um, this is where we have our models deployed, very small, which I will go through, very small footprint models, as well as computational power, and then the north-south uh, stack of the architecture itself from top down, um, the, and then how it works across basically connectivity, reachable, readable, uh, reachability, as well as prevents environmental perturbations as part of it. And this is a framework, um, again, how the framework works, very straightforward. Um, the balance we strike is uh, in, in, in terms of the following aspects. So we have three edges that we really focus on when we deploy the model. Uh, the hardware economy, if you will, you call it as hardware economy, uh, connectivity at trade-off, and finally, right, accuracy to a hardware trade-off. Uh, let me double click on it. What I mean by that is, right, Let's say I want to run a, a, a high intense, uh, high accurate machine learning model. The trade-off that I need to strike for this model to run in this operating environments, either to minimize the hardware so that the battery can last longer, or to minimize the connectivity so, so that the computational power as well as the pertinent storage and the hardware can be achieved with the SLA that we strike uh, with, the, with the, our farmers and customers across the world. Um, th this is a trade-off framework that we developed. Um, I, again, whenever we built a model, a supervised, unsupervised, um, not only we look at the accuracy point of view, but also we will look at um, what is the operating environment. We sign for one year to three years SLS, whether the model can operate without uh, battery replacement, without replacement in this SLS. This is our constant constant guidelines that we want to want to employ, that we are employing, and that we want to strike a greater, a greater balance uh, when deploying these models across this world. How the engineering device would look like? Very small device. As I said, right, this device has to operate under the environment. Second, it has to be it has to be withstanding of the environmental effects. And finally, it should be able to collect the data and upload to the cloud so that we can have a continuous feedback loop to farmers and then facilitate uh, the respect to business models that we develop for them. Very small, again, the, the most important one, this is a custom built hardware. The, the, this, this hardware can be, um, can be, can be expanded uh, with the third party, third party providers, which we have. Um, all we uh, collect is of six metrics majorly. Uh, one is temperature, humidity, both on the, connect, uh, on the contact side, uh, on the agriculture side, uh, ambient temperature, ambient humidity, and then we, collect uh, both um, gyro as well as accelerometer data. And then connectivity we use using as of now a BLD small sensors um, to, to, to have the battery power sustained for a longer time. Uh, basically, this is very simple, simple architecture framework. Um, uh, the, these, the, these sensors are deployed, which I have a demo at the end of the slides. Um, the they, farmers can connect to the sensors to get uh, the 
analysis on their mobile phones, as well as a, a start constant reporting of this data across across all the geos we deploy, a, a de-identified level of information they will get it. Uh, that includes the safety, uh, health of uh, cattle, as well as uh, the productivity that are looking at, all those factors they can get it on the tips of their mobile phones as of today. Uh, this is a data factor and this data is very really straightforward uh, as i said right it captures the location as well as uh, the the locate of uh, the um, uh, activity level as well as the gyroscope values of it now what models we deployed as i said we have deployed a complex supervised models that includes from the decision trees to xg boost uh, all we did was we created these models using a standard a, a standard frameworks using on the cloud as well as uh, Anaconda version software, a Jupyter notebook. We, uh, then we codified this. Once we have these models available, we translate these models into C code. We we have done two ways. One is basically take the models, convert it into intermediate for a byte format, and deploy the ones. The second one we converted the models into raw C code and then embed the raw C code as part of a firmware of the device and then burn the firmware device into the device um, and then start executing it and collecting the data as part of it. Um, again, as I said, right, we follow through a very strict guidance and framework to make sure the model that we deployed sustains the SLAs as well as delivers the performance that we promise to our, our small scale farmers. Uh, again, we employ the three Cartesian, uh, uh, Cartesian vectors of it. Uh, that is basically a connectivity was a hardware, uh, hardware to that of ML performance, ML performance to connectivity. And we see whenever, uh, what is the factor of improving one uh, with the trade of the others. For example, in this case, right, a classical supervised um, decision tree model. Um, again, one of the constraints that we see is a continuous Bluetooth advertisement could increase the power, power needed for the battery. Again, these trade-offs we'll do uh, to make sure that the model operate under this environment. As I said, right, most of the data sent models are very powerful, very beautiful to use. However, when they go into very constrained environments, which has limited by the operating as well as performance needs, we have to follow the scale down so that we can, we can have um, a successful run of it. Again, these are the stats of the models before and after we built. Uh, as I said, right, every byte counts for us, every joule of a battery counts for us, every performance metrics count for us um, to make sure the model works and the tiny ML operates in this environment. Um, again, these are very disconnected networks. There is no network at all some places. Um, again, if you see pre-run and post-run uh, for a decision tree networks, this is a diff network. This is a golden uh, stash that we see um, how much memory it consumes, how much memory it allocates, how much memory it releases. Uh, is there any lag or any leakage of memory that is, that is a showstopper uh, to deploy these models? Um, again, we, as I said, right, we, try, we deployed decision trees, Bayesian, which are very fantastic from the performance point of view, very simple um, you know, performance point of view, linear regression models uh, for the predictability uh, of lack of water, predictability of temperature increase, impact on the productivity. This goes into these devices now. Uh, again, these models are built on a standard cloud or a standard Jupyter network based models. And then we take this output of insights and then we codify them as a linear equations and a, in, a, in a firmware enabled devices um, and then mostly on the C code and then we make the X file and we deploy the X file. Again, same, same, same golden stats if you see for the linear regression. We look at a call stat level, we look at heap level to make sure um, that, that there's no leakage or performance um, yeah, issue due to, due to uh, computational power. Uh, they finally write uh, uh, supervised to uh, semi unsupervised models, hierarchical and k means cluster. This is where the toughness of models hits. Um, this is a classical use case, as I said, right? Uh, as average temperatures are increasing, we know we are reading in the news, we, we are witnessing in the field now, um, especially for, uh, given the global climate change, right? Um, these are the classical temperatures across the world uh, in a matrix that we form and we deploy them as part of as part of our models so that the device knows what temperature erosion it is. And based on this threshold values, it auto calibrates the device uh, to, to make machine learning more meaningful and contextual uh, to the local farmer. 
and finally, right, uh, when we deployed uh, the um, hierarchical and k-means cluster, uh, again, if you see the constraints goes up, given the, um, given the uh, nature of uh, the, um, not, uh, given the nature of uh, unsupervised models, uh, some of them has a performance of, uh, a, again, you take a time complexity of big O notation k to n square. In this case, right, number of tree structures uh, and the number of nodes that it collects based on that, uh, again, in our witness, we uh, in our uh, experience uh, serving the farmers almost six plus years now, um, supervised models are more friendly. Um, again, they they have a limitation from the uh, performance issue point of view. Or, um, but unsupervised model definitely helpful. But some of these uh, devices won't have the capacity to run them. Um, so we bring the uh, data to back to the cloud and we process them as part of it. Again, this is the. A classical difference when we deploy unsupervised models, uh, see the uh, allocation of the model each run, how much computational charge it will do on the battery, as well as the performance on the memory side, which impacts the sustainability of this model under the small 4 KB to 2 KB deployments, 2 KB, K per, K per kilo, kilobytes. Uh, finally, right, uh, this is a K-means cluster that we deployed uh, recently. Uh, again, we are, we are getting the mo most of the performance that we are looking at compared to hierarchical. K-means are much better provided we will see number of uh, uh, tree nodes can be reduced to some extent. And this is a final truth stat that we have seen across the world now. Um, again, I can allow to share the slides, uh, but uh, if uh, the, our major constraint, as I said, that's SLS that we write with our end customers, uh, the battery power, computational power, and storage, we should be able to capture them without losing. Uh, so we strike the balance running them in a small devices. Before, before I open the uh, questions for uh, everyone, this is a classical um, uh, deployment in, in Punjab, which is, which is, which is uh, uh, I think, um, Western part of India, Northwestern. Uh, this is where, how these models are run uh, for... <laughs> This is a four minutes video, given the time we have. Uh, I'll share this video as well as it's available on our on public website. Um, this is uh, the finally right. This is this is what our observation from the field. Um, it's need of the day. Uh, availability of AI across the world is the need of the day. Um, we have seen uh, recently with with a pandemic that we are going through. Data plays an important role, not only for sustainability of our lives, for our future. It is it is data is the future. And uh, data, if you have a data, if you have a data, then we have a sustainable future. Um, that includes a uh, uh, that includes taking care of food security as well as enabling our humanity through climate changes that we are witnessing and uh, the pandemic that we are going through. I think data uh, when we started a decade back, the data was was uh, considered to be a back office asset. Um, now data is a business critical strategy. It moves from back office to a, a C, a C, a CXO suit, and then it is with the stakeholders now, shareholders and stakeholders now. It is the na name of the game. It is the way how we can sustain ourselves for our future. We can give, leave our planet to our future generation better world if you have these devices available across across geo across economic zones that we wanted to democratize we back to you thank you thank you chandra i just want to know uh, let you know that our audience commented that these are great use cases and really great and meaningful work thank you thank you thank you so much yeah. So a couple of questions from our audience. I believe you addressed this already. Uh, what's the function of the gyra and accelerometer for the farmers? Uh, so so um, again, uh, 
generally the health factor of let's say these are uh, deploying we are deploying dairy cattle as well as camel fields um, one of the factors is whenever they see a health sign of a cow or a cattle uh, it is a lagging indicator for them by then it, when it gets a sick they know the animal is sick the purpose of gyroscope accelerometer is to trace the activity and then based on the activity we want to uh, pro pro proactively indicate uh, that we are seeing a health issue for this uh, cattle um, be, uh, either a cardiac veterinary or take care of so it's basically a proactive way of indicating the uh, cattle healthy as well as um, the effectiveness of the cattle health yeah we, that's a proactive um, uh, to derive the proactive um, uh, insights we, we use uh, accelerometers as well as gyroscope okay. i hope that answers question b yeah thank you so next question what will be the percentage of productivity improvement uh, this is ran in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, when we, our 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 um, uh, truth to the fact is, it it doubles doubles um, uh, down uh, the productivity level. We have seen anywhere between eleven to fifteen percent increase on the productivity. Uh, again, productivity in terms of um, the healthiness of a cattle, uh, the price factor they get it uh, with a minimal investment, and finally the improvement of their livelihood. For example, right the uh, in agriculture world especially the places where we came from especially you know very dominant agriculture countries um, cash cow is really cash cow what i mean by that is right like for example you set up an agriculture it's a six month investment one year investment for example rice pad or wheat wheat structures but milk is a immediate cash for a farmer. So uh, having the milk uh, basically enables them from bottom of uh, poverty line to come to the normal life. So it is 14% improvement is, uh, imagine uh, around seven, we have around 100,000, 100 million um, farmers, 14% of them could able to jump uh, from the low poverty to normal life. That's a beautiful success we are seeing from this. Okay. Uh, one last question. What's the model accuracy you observed in the field deployment? Again, uh, thank you for this question. This is constantly bothering us for a long time. Um, again, if you are apply, right, uh, citizen data scientists, farmers were the original citizen data scientists because they have to see the sun, they have to see the weather data point to f feel, the, feel the plants uh, so that they can have a good agriculture output. Though it's a million years of old tradition, right? Believe it or not, there is no data since million years, um, even, even to see what is happening on the farming land. And now when we started our accuracy models, right? We were trending north of 60%. That's all we used to get it at the time. That was a huge success factor. Now, after six years, right, we jumped from 60 to around 90 percent. What does it imply to farmer, right? If you say a cattle is trending towards non-healthy, automatically they will go call the veterinarians and then immediately they are back in business. So that is the beauty that we are bringing uh, with respect to the data that we are collecting. Again, this data has a very good meaningful, uh, not only to their livelihood, but also the community they serve, right? It is something they, they are doing a wonders with this. We are so thankful for them being our customers on this. Uh, you know, I will add one more question since it has been voted many times. Uh, is the hardware and the software implementation available as open source? Can we develop further and contribute to this effort? What other environment areas are in planning? Oh, definitely. Uh, so software uh, here, the magic is software. What if, not, not, let me let me step back my word. The magic here is the data. So uh, as I said, right, the the hardware is we have we are looking for a part uh, partners to develop the hardware. The success of this story is basically how small you want to make a device and how you get it to the field. Uh, how sustainable it works that is a success factor um, i think we are open to that and software we love to share our data to build the models 
our end goal is you know we want to leave the world with the best best of the best for the future generations may not be a commercial commercial win for us which are totally fine with that but what we want to make sure is the technology helps to the people that require the most important uh, to serve them it's, it's this is the this is the our our vision um, that we are we are really working and we are want to make sure it is it is the fact that we want to drive uh, to the to the to that end yeah Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. We also huge thanks again to our Tiny Mail Talk sponsors, DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and SinSense. DeepLight provides an AI-driven optimizer to make deep neural network faster, smaller, and energy efficient. Edge Impulse offers online TinyMail lifecycle solution, which transforms developers' abilities to deploy machine learning for embedded devices. Maxim Integrated enables edge intelligence with their sensors and signal conditioning technologies. Advanced AI acceleration solutions is coming soon. Kixo AutoML platform builds TinyML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI offers optimized feature discovery, compact embedded code, optimized toolkit, and tools for managing the cost of data collection. SingSense builds ultra-low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. ARM is also pleased to become TinyML strategic partner. ARM designs Cortex-M microcontrollers and ESOS U micro NPUs for TinyML applications. Early this year, we announced M55 and the U55, which will enable AI everywhere on billions of power efficient devices with greater on device machine learning processing capabilities. So, two weeks from now, on Tuesday, October 27th, 8 a.m. Pacific time, we will have presenters from Maximum Integrated and Edge Cortex to talk about uh, their technologies. If you're interested in participating, please contact talks at tinymail.org. We're also extremely happy to announce that TinyMail Asia Technical Forum will take place between November 16th to 19th this year virtually. Call for video posters is now open. Please submit your abstracts by October 31st. If you want to expand your business footprint in Asia, Tiny Mail Asia will be a great event to sponsor. Please contact Betty for more information. Thank you for your presentation today, Dr. Rajin and uh, Chandra. And uh, we're, hope we can see our audience soon.